Hassan reading Man's Search for Meaning by Victor Frankl. Man's Search for Meaning, Rahayati. Thank you, Toastmasters of the Evening. A brief background for the book. I'll be, reading, I'll be reading from this book. He's actually a psychiatrist and he was in a camp. He was a Jew, so during the Second World War in Germany, for six years he was actually in four camps. And he survived it. His wife died, parents died, and he was a survivor. He's also the person, uh, his psychiatrist who actually started logotherapy. By late 1990s, when he died, the book was in circulation with what, 10 million of it. And it's one of the most influential books in America. I bought this book, as you see, it's yellow. <laughs> About 15 years ago, couldn't read it because it was too dark. But when I read it, I find that his message is very powerful. That's what I want to share with you tonight. Woo to him who saw no more sense in his life, no aim, no purpose, and therefore no point in carrying on. He was soon lost. The typical reply with which such a man rejected of encouraging arguments was, I have nothing to expect from life anymore. What sort of answer can one give to that? What was really needed was a fundamental change in our attitude, attitude towards life. We had to learn ourselves and furthermore, we had to teach the despairing men that it did not matter what we expected from life, but rather what life expected from us. We needed to stop asking about the meaning of life and instead to think of ourselves as those who were being questioned by life daily and hourly. Our answer must consist not in talk and mediation but in right action and in right conduct. Life ultimately means taking the responsibility to find the right answer to its problems and to fill the task which it constantly sets for each individual. It had been a bad day. On the day, on the evening of this day, when we were fasting, we weren't given any food and many of our comrades died. I was not in the mood to give psychological explanations or to preach any sermons. I was cold and hungry, irritable and tired. But I had to make the effort and use this unique opportunity. Encouragement was now more necessary than ever. So I shared with my comrades, I began by mentioning the most trivial of comforts first. I said, even in Europe, in the sixth winter of Second World War, our station was not the most terrible. I said that each of us had to ask himself what irreplaceable losses he had suffered up to then. I speculated that for most of them, these losses had really been few. Whoever was still this, whoever was still alive, had reason for hope, health, family, happiness, professional abilities, fortune, position in society. All these were things that could be achieved again or restored. After all, we still had all our bones intact. Whatever we had gone through could still be an asset to us in the future. And I quoted from Nietzsche, 
That which does not kill me makes me stronger. Let us talk about the future. I said that to the, to the impartial, the future must seem hopeless. I agree that each of us could guess for himself how small were his chances of survival. I told them, although there was still no typhus epidemic in the camp, I estimated my own chances of living about 1 to 20. But I also told them that in spite of this, I had no intention of losing hope or give up. For no man knew what the future would bring, much less the next hour. Even if we could not expect any military events in the next few days, who knew better than we, with our experience of camps, how great chances sometimes open up quite suddenly for the individual. But I did not only talk of the future and the veil which was drawn over it. I also mentioned the past, all its joys, and how its light shone even in the present darkness. Again, I quoted a poet who had written, What you have experienced, no power on earth can take from you. Not only our experiences, but all we have done, whatever great thoughts we may have had, and all we have suffered, all this is not lost. Though it is past, we have brought it into being. Having been in is also a kind of being, and perhaps the surest kind. Then I spoke of the many opportunities of giving life a meaning. I told my comrades, Totally motionless. Although occasionally I hear a sigh, that human life under any circumstances never ceases to have a meaning, and that this infinite meaning of life includes suffering and dying, privation. I asked the poor creatures who listened to me attentively in the darkness of the hut to face up to the seriousness of our position. They must not lose hope but should, care, but should keep their courage in the certainty that the hopelessness of our struggle did not detract from its dignity and its meaning. I said that someone is always looking after us. A friend, a wife, somebody alive or dead, or a God. And he would not expect us to disappoint him. He would hope to find us suffering proudly, not miserably, knowing how to die. And finally I spoke of our sacrifice, which had meaning in every case. It was in the nature of this sacrifice that it should appear to be pointless in the normal world, the world of material success. But in reality, our sacrifice did have a meaning. Those of us who had any religious faith could understand without difficulty. I told them of a comrade who, on his arrival in this camp, had tried to make a pact with heaven that his suffering and death should save the human being he loved from a painful end. For this man, suffering and death were meaningful. His was a sacrifice of the deepest significance. He did not want to die for nothing. None of us wanted that. The purpose of my words was to find a full meaning in our life, then and there, in that hut, 
And in that practically hopeless situation, I saw that my efforts had been successful. When the electric bulb flared up, again, I saw the miserable figures of my friends limping toward me to thank me with tears in their eyes. Back to you.